much, and I would like to introduce uh, Vijaya back to the stage. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, this panel, uh, I'm very pleased to announce uh, the panelists here uh, focused on differentiating capacities. Uh, we have actually three subtypes of faculty here. Some of them are faculty who uh, are experts in data science and are also working on some data science questions. And uh, we also have subject matter experts who have been working for several years on a interesting questions. And we also have some computer scientists who are real data scientists who have been building uh, interesting algorithms and uh, looking for collaboration. So as the title suggests, it's differentiating capacities, which nothing but a spectrum of people with different expertise uh, interested to work with uh, new people and meet new people. So I want to first of all talk about the kind of work that I've been doing in the Met campus. Uh, I'm one of those faculties who is trying to do both data science and also working on a specific problem. Uh, uh, the title says Memory and Pain, uh, and I'm very excited to talk about it because uh, these are the two questions that uh, you know, we are interested in. Um, you know, memory and pain, you know, there are two interesting concepts. Uh, everybody knows about them, but in reality, if you really think about them, uh, what's memory and what's pain? Can you see that? Can you see pain? Can you see memory? Maybe we can feel that. But it's actually an interesting data science question because if, you, if somebody has, let's say, a fracture on a bone, uh, you can look at an x-ray, and then you can see the fracture, potentially. Uh, but can you actually see pain? Can you see memory? So those are the two questions that I'm really interested in. And when it comes to memory and pain, uh, there is a, a spectrum of diseases that are associated with them, uh, starting with uh, I think many of you know about this Alzheimer's disease. Just to give you a quick statistic about it, you know, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth uh, leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, and I also want to point out one more statistic, which is related to the cost. $7.9 trillion is expected to uh, really the cost it would take to do accurate and early treatment of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And there are many more statistics here, so I don't want to go through all those things with you. But I want to just quickly go to the data science problem. So it's a fascinating data science problem. Uh, first of all, there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. So identifying the preclinical stages of Alzheimer's disease is very critical. Uh, and in fact, everybody ages, right? And so there is a cognitive decline for everybody because it's normal aging is a process. But it's also important to differentiate between normal cognitive decline versus this preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And the question is, can we train these computers to, in fact, see or maybe search for patterns uh, that are associated with memory decline, especially with respect to preclinical AD? And our hypothesis is that no single data modality, whether it's imaging data or text data or non-imaging data, uh, can be sufficient to really perform this early detection. And we are in the process of building these models. So one of the results that I want to show is to basically talk about this multimodal data fusion as a data science problem. So here we are talking about imaging data, MRI imaging data. And we're also talking about uh, other forms of non-imaging data, like neuropsychological tests. So our goal was to basically see if we can come up with a method to combine uh, uh, all these different data types to answer a simple question, and that is to really understand uh, preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease, which is called, which is again broadly classified as mild cognitive impairment. And, and here what you're seeing is this deep neural network that we built uh, by that utilized basically imaging data and some other forms of data to really come up with a prediction. And we actually demonstrated on a large national cohort, uh, it's called as a National Alzheimer's uh, Coordinating Center-based uh, data set, uh, which has about hundreds of patients that uh, have had some symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And we collected data from all these uh, places, and then we build these fusion models to actually show that fusion models can outperform uh, the models that can be constructed using a single modality. So again, this is a way we are trying to build uh, machine learning models using uh, different forms of data to address a very important clinical and growing epidemic, which is Alzheimer's disease. And I also want to talk quickly about pain, right? And we, when it comes to pain, I think, as everybody knows, as people age, they talk about joint pains. In fact, uh, there is a statistic which says that about 80% of people who are 65 and plus have some sort of joint pain. So pain, again, is a very common disorder. Uh, you can't see pain. You can feel pain. So the question is, can you ask a computer to, in fact, 
C pain. It's not easy. So what, again, we are trying to do is that we are talking about combining or thinking about uh, modalities that can identify the causes of pain. Same thing like AD here, there is no cure for osteoarthritis. Here, the goal is to really identify preclinical stages of osteoarthritis, which is related to joint pain. Uh, again, we want to think about differentiating between normal aging versus uh, preclinical uh, osteoarthritis, which is again related to joint pain. Uh, so in this case, what we are doing is we are again using MRI as the imaging modality to really look at all these data sets. It's actually a pretty nationwide cohort here. We have about 2,000 cases of patients collected over the entire nation who have some preclinical symptoms of osteoarthritis. And what we want to do is we want to see how pain is caused. And in fact, we want to identify the regions where pain can be caused. And we are, again, building these uh, deep neural networks to uh, combine all these imaging data. It's three-dimensional. There is a lot of data that comes out of it. And the goal is to really look at uh, uh, this modality, which is called as rep representation learning, to sort of really think about what are the areas within the joint that are actually leading to that prediction. So whether a person actually has pain or no pain, but what are the regions that, that are getting highlighted while the models are getting built. So this representation learning is allowing us to really think about the sources of knee pain, which I think is, again, a very interesting idea. So these are the two things that I want to talk about. And in summary, um, so memory and pain-related disorders are growing epidemics in the country, affecting millions of people uh, around the world, and creating actually enormous burden on the healthcare system. And the costs are only increasing. And in fact, people are expecting by 2050, these things are going to triple in terms of the costs. And the goal here is to really think about how different forms of data are, that are available that can be used to solve these different problems. Um, and we need to also appreciate the fact that there is no single modality that is sufficient to address these questions. These are really hard questions, Alzheimer's disease, osteoarthritis, memory disorders, joint pain. It's not easy to solve these problems. So the goal is to sort of really come up with models that can really do some kind of early assessment even before the disease uh, uh, is diagnosed. And in fact, what we believe is this data anal analytic modality such as deep learning and representation learning can facilitate decent advancements in terms of predicting early stages of this disease. And uh, my team here, Dr. Rhoda Oh, who is the Director of Neuropsychology at Framingham Heart Study, has provided the brain data. And Dr. David Felson, uh, who is the clinical ch uh, Chief of uh, Clinical Epi at Boston uh, Medical Center, has provided the, the osteoarthritis-related data. And it's my team. Thank you. And uh, now I want to introduce uh, Lucy Hotira, uh, who is an uh, Associate Professor of uh, uh, Chemistry. Uh, Earth and Environment, sorry. <laughs> sorry, there are too many uh, uh, faculty who emailed about this. And she's going to talk about carbon cycles and uh, how data science can be useful uh, in terms of solving a very important, again, global uh, climate change related problem. Thank you. Thank you. So my lab, we primarily study carbon dioxide in cities. And I feel like I need to start with a big picture primer on what am I talking about with the cycling of carbon dioxide. So this is a cartoon graphic that shows our CO2 climate problem. So this is showing where the CO2 is and how CO2 moves through our global uh, system. So what my group works on is we work on trying to improve estimation of fossil fuel emissions to understand where, when, and what processes are driving greenhouse gas emissions, particularly CO2. And then we also look at it from a biological perspective, thinking about biological sources of carbon dioxide through soil processes, through plant processes. So these are decomposition and metabolic processes that plants undergo. We also think about it from the uptake side of how plants take up CO2. We also look at land use change. And so in the course of 10 minutes, I'm going to take you on a world tour of how all of this comes together to influence CO2 in the atmosphere. So I looked it up. Today's CO2 in the atmosphere is 412 parts per million. And it's an astonishing change that we're seeing that's impacting everything in all of our lives. So this problem of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is, um, in, in some respects, 
it's viewed as an easy problem because it's fossil fuel emissions. So this is a graph that shows through time the rates of global, greenhouse, global fossil fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. This lost its animations. That's too bad. Um, so this is considered the best known piece of our carbon cycle. It has an uncertainty on order of 5 or 10%. So the gray bounds that you see around that trend line mean that we know this quite well. Our uncertainty on all those other processes I showed are not 5 or 10%. But one of the challenges that we have is that most of the climate action that we're having today is not occurring at global scales. It's actually, particularly in the US, it's happening at city scales. So cities are trying to tackle this global problem. And the uncertainties on city scale emissions are not 5 or 10%. So this is a paper that um, one of my former students and I published last year. And what we tried to do was we tried to look at, well, what are these uncertainties on city scale greenhouse gas emissions? So we built an emissions product. And I'll walk you through a little bit of that data solution to this uncertainty problem. And we also compared our product to three other global widely used products. And what we found is a bit disconcerting. On a regional scale, say if you take the entire Northeast United States, we saw agreements of 20%, which is not great. At a city scale, which again is where most of the action is, we saw 50 to 200 percent differences in what we think the greenhouse gas emissions coming out of cities are. And that's a real challenge because cities, through mechanisms like the neutral, uh, Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, have made incredible pledges for greenhouse gas reductions. So the city of Boston, along with a number of other US cities, have pledged to reach net carbon neutrality by 2050. This is an amazing goal and demonstrates a tremendous political will. But if we're going to get to zero emissions, we need to know our emissions well to see if we're actually getting there. Do we, are, are we doing anything through these policies? And Boston's not alone. There's been a propagation of um, networks and efforts to do this. There's the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate. This is 7,100 cities across the globe that are trying to tackle the climate problem. There's the C40. There's the Climate Mayors. There's America's Pledge. There's uh, the US Sustainability Directors Network. There's ICLE. There's Driving Sustainable Economies. There's faith-based organizations. There's a huge number of people that want to try to solve our climate problem. But understanding the emissions and actually quantifying progress towards emissions reduction, I think, is central. So I've laid out the data problem, which is what are the emissions. And what my group has spent the last decade working on is to try to measure it and try to build better models, data models, of what those emissions look like. So this is a bit of a cartoon graphic. Um, this shows a farm, a city, some cars, and people. and these. This sort of uh, represents, and I hope this animation works, um, what our current approaches are. So our current approaches to estimating greenhouse gases are either bottom up. And so we'll take some sort of activity data, and we'll use accounting methods where we'll multiply an activity, like vehicle miles traveled, or kilowatts of electricity consumed, times an emissions factor. So each mile equals x number of CO2 molecules. And that's one approach. And that's a model. Another approach is to measure CO2 in the air. And so you can use a top down where we know what the CO2 in the air is. It's a version of truth. We know that we have, as I said, 421 parts per million CO2 in the air today. But how did it get there? And what are the processes that emitted that CO2 or maybe aliased that CO2, where we had some emitted, but then biology took some away simultaneously. And how does that come together? So what we've done um, to try to tackle this problem is we've built an observing network across the Boston region. So these points 
including one on the roof of the CAS building, we're measuring CO2 and methane in the middle of a city. So what is the truth of how much CO2 we have in the air? And then outside the city, we're measuring air that is flowing and blowing into the city. We've built a priori estimates of where that CO2 is coming from. So we've built fossil fuel emissions models. We've built biological flux models for those other processes of the biological sources and sinks for CO2. And then my colleagues at Harvard have been running an atmospheric transport model to move those CO2 molecules through space and time. And there was an equation that showed how that all came together, but you'll believe me when I say it all comes together. Um, so this is an example of what the data looks like. Um, this is CO2 in the air on the roof of uh, CAS and at Harvard Forest, which is about 100 kilometers west of us in a rural area dominated by forest cover. And the colors uh, show CO2 concentrations. Um, on the x-axis is month, and I, we start in the summer. And then on the y-axis is time of day. So you could see a lot of variability related to seasons. You also see large differences in the CO2 um, between these two locations that are only 100 kilometers apart. So that's a bit of what the data looks like on our truth of how much CO2 we have in the air. Another piece of our solution is to build better bottom-up activity-based data sets. So this is uh, an emissions data set that my group constructed. Um, it's called the ACES model. Um, and this is for a 16-state region in, across the Northeast United States. This is now publicly available for download, and I am proud to say that we are the second most downloaded data set at the Oak Ridge uh, Data Active Archive. Um, mo there's model driver data, and then there's ours for how much CO2 is coming out of cities, which is kind of cool. Um, and this is a really heterogeneous data set. What we've built in this data set is an hourly, one kilometer resolved estimate by emitting sector for where the CO2 is coming from. And this is a fusion of lines, points, and area sources of CO2. So we're separately modeling residential, commercial, industrial facilities, roads, airports, and so forth. This is an example of what total emissions look like. Here's what's coming from our roads, which you can see uh, concentrated in cities. Here's what's coming from residential areas where people live. And as I said, one of the things we did when we built this, this model is we tried to compare it with other people's models. And so these are three other high quality, excellent models for what CO2 emissions look like in, in across this broad domain, 16 states that you're looking at here. And this agrees within 20%. If we zoom in and we look at New York City, I'm biased, I'm always talking about Boston, so this time I'm talking about New York. Um, you get a very different picture of what the emissions look like. And depending on how these models were constructed and the data that underlie them, if you look at it this as a relative percent difference basis, it's huge differences. In Manhattan, which the red won't show up on the red, it's 200, 300, 400 percent differences in emissions, which means that we don't know this very well. This is a model, and it's a model that we've recently been funded to extend to the entire United States. So this is an almost final version of US-wide hourly one kilometer uh, on-road emissions, residential emissions. So that's the first half of the problem that we've been working on. The other part is trying to think about, that was fossil fuels, we're also trying to think about biology. And so here we'll go back to Boston. And this is a 25 kilometer cross section. So you've got an image going from downtown Boston out along Route 2 past Route 95, which is the orange line that you see at the top, out to Weston area. So you go from very paved to, veg to forest and some agriculture dominated areas. And this is a picture of what our models estimate during the winter. This doesn't work well. During the winter, what fossil fuel emissions look like, what that biological release of CO2 looks like, and what the biological uptake looks like. 
So the black line in the winter on a log scale, you see that fossil fuel emissions completely dominate. Vegetation is largely dormant. There's some biological release in the orange colored line, but there's no biological uptake. That green line is along the bottom. As the leaves come out on the trees, you see that just a few kilometers from the city, the story changes. And so we've built these biological models. And in the middle of summer, the biological uptake 15 kilometers outside of downtown Boston exceeds all fossil fuel emissions. So that entire atmospheric signal has been aliased by biology. And we've taken a lot of ground measurements to try to understand pro uh, from a process perspective what that means. Now, in the afternoon window, so that was a 24-hour basis, on an afternoon basis from 11 to 4, and this is a magic period when the atmosphere is better behaved and satellites are watching, which I'll get to in a minute, the biology exceeds in the springtime for over half of this area. The bump that you see um, right around 20 kilometers is Route 95. So that's a highway signal. And then in the middle of the summer, it gets wider. And that's because we have things like irrigated golf courses in the middle of the city, which our human management activities are causing to have a very large CO2 signal. So when we combine these models that I've laid out for you, a fossil fuel model and a biological model, together with the CO2 that we're measuring in the city, we see something kind of cool, I think. We see that our model and observations in the black and blue agree really well, which means our first guess, our models were pretty good in matching the observations. The gray line that you see below is the air that was flowing into the city. So you see that urban enhancement in the CO2, but most interesting to me is that in the summertime, the enhancement goes to zero. So the biology for a large fraction of a year has completely eliminated the signal of anthropogenic activities from fossil fuel emissions in the middle of a city. So a next step of what my group is working on is the Orbital Carbon Observatory 3. This was supposed to be launched this month, but the government shut down. It will now be launched on March 27th, I believe. And this is a satellite that will be housed on the International Space Station that will be measuring afternoon CO2 concentrations over cities from space. And exactly at that afternoon period when the biology is most active, um, one of the cities that they will be targeting will be us. And the observing network that I described here of all the ground observations, the fossil fuel emissions estimates, and the atmospheric observations are a key validation for this. So this is one of the most exciting things I've ever worked on. I can't wait for the satellite to launch. I'm actually going to go watch the launch, which will be cool. Um, so that's uh, our data problem and some of our steps towards solutions. Next, we have uh, Dan Lee, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and uh, Environment, and he's going to focus on atmospheric science models. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dan Lee, and I'm also from the Department of Earth and Environment. And uh, um, today, I'm going to talk about data science and atmospheric research. <coughs> Um, but atmospheric research, I'm really talking about the physics and the dynamics of the atmosphere. So um, this is a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. First, I'll um, briefly introduce you um, about my research interests. And then I'll talk about the problem that I have in mind, uh, which I think is a good problem for combining some of the atmospheric models that we're working on and data science tools that uh, many of you in the audience have. And uh, I'll mention a little bit about what the idea that I have, and I'm open for collaborations. So just to give you an idea of things that I'm working on, um, my primary research interest is about atmospheric dynamics. Um, but I work on uh, atmospheric dynamics across a range of scales. So we, um, my group has been working on um, you know, things related to global climate change. Uh, we're using global climate models and global Earth system models, essentially, to predict how the climate is going to look like uh, you know, in the late 21st century, 
And these model simulations are essentially the inputs for all the IPCC reports. Um, so uh, as Lucy just mentioned, uh, although the climate problem is like a global problem, most of the um, actions that we take uh, to tackle the climate change problem are actually occurring at local scales. Um, so a lot of the research in my group has been also focusing on uh, you know, atmospheric dynamics problems at very fine scales. So on the right, you see actually a, a simulation that we did uh, over the um, Commonwealth Avenue. So you can see how the flow uh, patterns, uh, how complicated it looks like just across uh, the, the small campus uh, that we are in right now. So um, this is just to give you an idea of things that I'm working on. But today, I'm not going to talk about uh, you know the things that we have uh, published and worked on over the past few years, but rather I'm going to focus on a problem that I have in mind, uh, which I would, like, would love to work on in the next few years. So this problem is related to atmospheric dispersion, and the, it's, it's, a, it's a very classic problem that has been uh, in atmospheric science for a long time. It's basically a release of hazard materials over complex terrain, like in a city. And the reason that this problem came into my mind is because a few years ago we did a study about how the uh, Fukushima accident actually released all these like hazard materials and how those materials were transported across you know complex terrain, including you know um, building terrains and also topographies uh, in Japan. So the current approach, there are basically two approaches on this problem. The first one is that we use very simple models like Gaussian models, and the basic characteristic of this of this approach is that it doesn't really work over complex terrain when you have you know buildings and uh, complex topography it really don't it really doesn't work on the other hand you can employ like the simulations that i just you know showed you like very complex computational fluid dynamics models and these models are simply too expensive to run and by expensive i mean both in terms of time and in terms of computational resources um, so when it comes to time, you know, you want the models to produce results fast so that you can basically react or respond to this hazard event very fast. And also, even with uh, a lot of like computational resources, these models still take quite a long time to, to run. Consider that the time scale that you want to respond is on the order of a few hours, right? So the proposed idea that I have is to basically integrate this, uh, the model simulations that we have, um, machine learning algorithms, techniques, and also sensing technology. So the roadmap that uh, I'm going to talk about, which is something, of course, open for discussion, is that uh, we essentially will use the models that we use, um, which are pretty complex, but to do pre-simulated scenarios. So we're going to simulate you know, all possible cases, consider variations in meteorological conditions, you know, locations that you might actually have this release of hazard materials, and based on all this data, we are going to develop machine learning algorithms to link inputs, which in this case can be concentrated at a few places that can be measured by you know, sensors that we put uh, in this particular location, to outputs, which would be concentrations at key destinations that you really care about. So once we build those models, we can test whether these models can really reproduce the CFD model results and also capture field observation data. So we are going to do a lot of like numeric and field uh, test. So the key advantages of this approach compared to the two approaches that I mentioned is that nearly all the computational costs incur before the disaster. So we will do all these simulations before it really happens which makes it you know, cheap in the sense that you know, once it happens, we don't really need to do this computational uh, expensive simulation. We just did it before. And it allows us to actually have much faster response once this thing happens. And by combining this with you know, sensing technologies, which basically will be you know, identify where you can get really important inputs to help develop this algorithm, you can actually help find the most effective sensing locations. You know, this will be one of the byproduct of this whole exercise. Uh, with that, I'll stop and I'll be um, happy to talk more about this. Um, you know, afterwards to collaborate with you guys. Thank you very much.
Our next speaker is uh, Elaine Noisisi. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the uh, School of Public Health, uh, Department of Global Health, uh, and focused on the obesity epidemic. Hi, everyone. So um, today I'll talk to you about a problem, but I don't have a solution for this problem. So I'm going to tell you about how we're thinking about this problem and how we're studying it. So my background is in math, statistics, and computational epidemiology, um, which is kind of interesting that I ended up in the global health department. Uh, so what I do is I look at a range of different data sources and how we can use that for public health surveillance. So I look at things like social media data, um, satellite images, business review data from places like Yelp, uh, restaurant reservation data, and basically try to make sense of this data in, in the context of public health. So obesity is a problem that we all know about. It's a very complex health issue. It's not something that we can explain with a single cause. Um, there are multiple factors that have been linked to obesity, so this range from how people people's diet to exercise to um, other factors like genetics and your environment. In the US, obesity affects about one third of the adult population. And individual, individuals that are obese tend to be at higher risk for several different diseases, including coronary heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, and diabetes. So the first data source that I'll talk a little bit about is social media and how we're using social media to study obesity prevalence in the US. So this is an example of what uh, a tweet looks like. So right over here. Um, so you have a Twitter handle, date time of the tweet, user profile picture, um, hashtag, number of likes, number of retweets, et cetera. Um, so from Twitter, you can get explicit data about the user, but you can also get explicit data about the tweet. And from the tweet information and the user information, you can extract different types of information that can be useful for different purposes. So for example, to look at disease state, you can just look at someone's tweet. So someone can tweet and say, I have the flu or I have symptoms of the flu, and that's information that we can use for public health purposes. You can also look at people's profile information to infer things like gender. Um, political party uh, affiliations, um, occupation, etc., And you can also process tweets to get uh, different types of information, including sentiment, uh, language, um, content, for different purposes. So we've been using Twitter data for several different uh, research topics. And the types of data we collect differs depending on the question that we're asking. So in this particular case, where we were looking at obesity, we thought about looking at food and exercise data. So this is just a tweet of, of food, <laughs> so an example of the kind of data that we have. So we look at um, what types of food are people tweeting about, and then classify this as healthy or unhealthy, given information from the USDA. <coughs> and then we also look at exercise data. So are people talking about exercising, and what types of exercise are they actually mentioning? And all of this data is geotagged, the data we're collecting for this research, so we can map this back to specific geographical locations in the US. So for this particular study, we collaborated with a group at the University of Maryland College Park, and they collected about 80 million tweets, and then processed that to identify ones that were specifically about exercise and ones that were specifically about food. And at the end, we ended up with about 2 million uh, food tweets and about 1 million exercise tweets that were actually relevant. So these are actually tweets of people saying that I went to the gym or I went hiking, uh, things like that. So once we aggregate this data, um, th there are lots of different things that we can do with it. One, one uh, thing we can do is look at calories consumed. So given a standard meal that someone mentions, we can estimate how many calories are in that meal using data from the USDA. So in this case, we, we did a lot of different things. So the first thing was actually to figure out gender. Um, Twitter does not have uh, a requirement for people to, to actually enter whether they're male or female or um, another gender. But there's been a lot of computer science research around this, so trying to infer uh, gender from Twitter data. And so we use some of those methods and process all the users in our data and identify or classify them as male and female. 
And then we look at calories consumed and compare this at the state level. So what you can see in this graph is basically, in most states, there are very significant differences between the kinds of foods that males or men talk about compared to the kinds of foods that women talk about. So in most cases, what we find is that women tend to talk about foods when they're feeling guilty. So I had a big burger today, so I'll tweet about it. Um, while men would talk about more healthy food options. Uh, so the other, and on the other side, we can look at calories burnt as well. So what kinds of exercise do people talk about um, and estimate for an average American adult how many calories would they burn in 30 minutes of exercise? And so this again shows you for males and females. And so in general, men tend to brag about what kind of exercises <laughs> they're involved in. And so then we put all of this data together, apply statistical models, and try to come up with an estimate of obesity prevalence at the county level for uh, these two different groups. So this is what we have for, for women specifically. So what I want to highlight in this case is that the data is incomplete, so there are several counties where we don't have data, but overall we seem to be capturing spatial trends in obesity prevalence. And then this is for men. Um, so similarly, we're, we seem to be able to capture trends in obesity prevalence across the US. So I'm going to mention satellite images pretty quickly um, because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I think I'm missing a slide over here. I don't know what happened. But um, so there's been a lot of studies looking at the built environment and obesity. But different studies measure the built environment differently. And so what we wanted to, to, to do was to see whether AI can help in this, in this problem. So we got data for a bunch of cities. Uh, this is Memphis, Seattle, Bellevue, Tacoma in Washington, San Antonio, Los Angeles. And then we also got data on estimates of obesity prevalence from the CDC, points of interest data from Google, per capita income at the census tract level, and then satellite images from Google. And this is an example of what an image looks like. So this is zoom level 18. Um, seems like all my information is gone. <laughs> uh, but uh, these images were collected for all the different census tracts for all the different cities that we're interested in. And also just to mention, so the, the numbers here are rankings in terms of obesity prevalence. So Tennessee is the sixth most obese state in the US. And then we applied a, a convolutional neural network model using transfer learning uh, methodology and ended up with something like this. So this is San Antonio, uh, Texas. And we, so San Antonio has high obesity prevalence, so we wanted to apply this across cities that had high and low obesity prevalence. And so this is what our data, actual data looks like, so the actual estimate, and then that is the estimate that we're getting from our models. And this estimate is being constructed just using Im uh, information about the built environment that we're extracting using artificial um, intelligence or deep, deep neural networks. Um, we did the same thing for Los Angeles. And again, you have the actual and the estimate. And basically what we're showing is that we can actually use this tool to infer things about the built environment and be able to construct some estimates on how these different features of the built environment correlate with obesity prevalence. And when we look at this a little bit more closely, what we see is that um, there are quite some differences in the census tracts that we're focusing in. So this would be a census tract with uh, higher obesity prevalence, and then that would be a census tract with lower obesity prevalence. Uh, just to show you this a little bit more, so this is, uh, this is Memphis, Tennessee. And so if we look at census tracts that have low obesity prevalence and then census tracts that have high obesity prevalence, these are kind of the differences that we're seeing. So this reinforces our method in that we're capturing things that have been shown in other studies that places where you have more green space, more parks, people are more likely to be less obese because they have more opportunities to go out and actually exercise. So there are several contributors to this work. Uh, Nina Siza, who is here at Boston University, and then we have Pallavi and Queen, who are University of Maryland, and then Adaya Shah, who is in uh, Scrum. Um, well, we're always looking for collaborations, and so if you're interested in this work and want to talk to us, um, please, you can find me or send me an email. <coughs> Thank you.
Our next speaker is uh, Chris Wells uh, from the Department of Journalism, focused on uh, political media. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, so I'm Chris Wells in the Department of Journalism. Um, as uh, maybe in, in, being in the minority as a social scientist here, I just wanted to say a few things by way of introduction. Um, so our field is, is definitely very interested in data science, and we're doing quite a bit to adapt techniques that are uh, really being innovated by computer scientists, statisticians, lots of the other folks that we've, we've heard about here. We're also benefiting from a great availability of, of new data, as I'll talk about, from both social media, as, as Elaine just described, and also from news media, that we have much more access to databases of uh, communications, my, my specialty field, um, that we're able to, to mine and process to gain insights into how our communication system works. So let me, um, let me try to, let me begin by talking a little bit about the theoretical problems that I work on, the kind of big picture of, of questions that I'm trying to answer, and then give you a little bit of an introduction to ways that we're going about answering those questions with an eye to inviting uh, collaborations. I'd love to talk to people who would be interested in helping us to refine and develop our techniques for understanding um, our, our media system. So theoretically speaking, um, my field is very interested in the question of how our media system works or, um, or whether we have a media system indeed, uh, given that it's so chaotic and often idiosyncratic. So some of the theoretical work that we're doing is trying to understand what a system is and whether we have one when it comes to um, political media. We're thinking about qualities of systems that include differentiation, whether you have different components of a thing that in some way work together, and whether you can apply that to a, a media system. Um, structures that uh, allow interaction, cooperation, influence, conflict resolution, whether those are appropriately applied to our media system. Um, although our media system seems very chaotic and idiosyncratic, in order for it to be a system, we have an intuition that it must have some degree of repetition, reproducibility, uh, regularity. So how does that work? And then ultimately that has to result in um, some form of system regulation and, and reproduction. Just to give a little bit of an example of what we're, we're looking at, we're really interested in the media system's components. Um, and to briefly describe some of the components that now make up our media system, as I'm sure you're aware, these include news outlets, which were the 20th century's uh, main core of the media system, news makers like politicians and activists. Increasingly, we now have social media users who interact with those different kinds of actors. Algorithms play a crucial role in defining how our media system works. There are automated actors, bots on Twitter and other places that play an important role, and so on and so forth. So how are these differentiated and how do they work together? I'm going to narrow down to give a little bit of an overview of the research we've begun doing just on the news outlets to begin. How are news outlets interacting with one another to define the way that our society is characterized in, uh, in media? Here's a very simple map of our media system when it comes to, to news outlets. To very briefly describe the axes, the left to right axis is simply partisanship. On the right, you have conservative outlets. On the left, you have uh, liberal outlets. Up and down is something a little different. The, ones at the, the outlets at the top are the ones that are most embedded in the social media ecology. So those are the most successful at sharing their stories in social media, while controlling for really the amount of legitimacy they have within the core media system. So you'll see down at the bottom, you have Politico, Washington Post. Those are kind of very, uh, very core journalistic outlets. Whereas at the top, you have Daily Coast on the left, Breitbart on the right. Those are heavily shared in social media, less significant in, um, uh, uh, in mainstream media. This is really just a map to try to give us some categories of media that we can begin to use to, to parse apart the media system to see how it's interacting. Here's where kind of the data science comes in. If we have a media system and we think that it has these different components that interact with one another, an interesting question is, what is the medium of interaction? What is the thing that's being exchanged? Uh, to use an analogy from biology, if we were talking about an ecosystem, we would probably talk about some kind of unit of energy, uh, maybe calories or maybe protein or something like that. 
If the media system is a system, what is the thing that it exchanges, that it trades between these different outlets or uses to influence one another? Um, what's being exchanged? So a couple of possibilities I'm going to introduce you to. One is the agenda. What is being uh, talked about by different kinds of media outlets? And I'll show you that in a moment. Something that's kind of orthogonal to the agenda is how are things being talked about? What sort of tone is being applied to various entities within the political communication landscape, such as candidates, which is what I'll talk about um, now. So here's some of the preliminary work that we've, we've done. It's just going to be a, a rough example to give you a sense of how we're investigating these questions. In this case, we're looking at the last 100 days of the 2016 presidential election. So this runs from August 1st through the end of the election, about uh, November 9th. We took 22 news outlets, the ones that I just showed you, and we did a simple scrape to grab all of their articles that were about the election. Really, we just sampled on the ones that mentioned either one of the, the main candidates. We did a couple of things. In order to identify the main topics that the articles were about, we used a system that's been developed by a political scientist named Molly Roberts called Structural Topic Modeling, which is an unsupervised machine learning method for detecting topics uh, within news outlets. And in particular, we focused on scandals, which actually turned out to play a major role in, in the election and, and in news coverage. So you'll, you won't see the other topics. I've just focused in on scandals here um, in this analysis. So that's one way of looking at exchange within the media system. Another way would be uh, sentiment or tone. So we used a, a Google Cloud natural language processing tool to identify the sentiment that was being applied either to Clinton or to Trump during those last 100 days of the campaign by anyone, within any one of these um, articles. So I'm first going to show you simply a descriptive map of here's how the outlets characterized either the agenda or the tone of the campaign. Then, in order to identify the degree to which outlets are influencing one another, we're using straight, fairly straightforward time series modeling techniques uh, to look at which outlet's coverage precedes another which is a fairly uh, circumstantial way of assessing influence, but it's one that we're working on. Um, so that's what you're going to see next. So let me begin. First, this is le the left-wing media ecosystem. These are outlets like The New Yorker and, uh, and Rolling Stone. This is how they characterize the election across the last 100 days. Just to give you some sort of face validity, you'll see the big magenta spike in the middle. Uh, that is the Trump uh, infamous Access Hollywood tape. Um, so you can see that's the, the Trump tape scandal. The left-wing media system was very excited to cover that scandal um, when, it, when it occurred. Uh, a couple of weeks later, where you see the uh, olive green kind of take over, uh, at that point, left-wing media ecosystems coverage was much more dominated by, uh, again, the infamous Comey letter, which announced that uh, the FBI was reopening investigation into uh, Clinton's uh, emails. So we have some face validity here that we are picking up on the topics that were actually being talked about by, uh, by, by news media. Moreover, when we contrast different components of the media system, for example, the left and the right, we can see they were talking about quite different things. Here we have the right-wing media ecosystem talking about the same things. Again, we have that magenta spike. Uh, outlets such as Fox News did mention that there was an Access Hollywood tape uh, that affected Trump. But you see their coverage of that died out quite quickly. So they mentioned it, uh, they made some excuses for it, and then they kind of forgot about it. Also interesting is that at the very same time, uh, the right-wing ecosystem uh, provided as much coverage, if not more, uh, to Hillary Clinton's emails as they did to the Trump tape. Uh, partly this is because they always were covering uh, Clinton's emails. But interestingly, when it, when it comes to the idiosyncrasies of the, oops, of the political communication system, it happened that the very same afternoon that the Trump tape scandal broke, WikiLeaks released a batch of thousands of John Podesta's emails, uh, one of the key figures in the Hillary Clinton campaign. Uh, so we have very interesting temporal dynamics of events that are occurring, sometimes by strategic actors, such as WikiLeaks, that intercede with the normal processing of, uh, of political communications. Uh, then, of course, once the Comey letter uh, is released, the right-wing ecosystem uh, as well um, uh, identifies that. 
So we, we take these day-by-day -day measures of the, the campaign agenda by different aspects of the, uh, the media system, and we, uh, we time series model them and produce maps that look something like this. And these kind of look like hairballs at this point. Whether we can derive a lot of meaning from these is something that we're kind of trying to assess. This is sort of a schematic of what does influence look like when it comes to the Clinton scandals. Um, during the last 100 days of the campaign. It looks to us as though the mainstream media is driving the sort of peripheral forms of media to, uh, to cover scandals more so than the other way around, um, which is somewhat interesting because a, a book just written by scholars at Harvard uh, argued the opposite, that actually the right-wing ecosystem was goading uh, centrist media into covering things like the Clinton Foundation. We don't find that to be the case. Um, but we're, we're not entirely confident in these day-by-day these -day time series models that we're not getting a lot of type 1 error, essentially, especially with this many tests. Um, when we look at the, the Trump scandals, we have even more of a hairball, where sussing out influence is, uh, is, a, real, is a real challenge. So I'm not going to do too much to try to decipher what's happening there. Very briefly, so far we have talked about the agenda, uh, uh, what it is that uh, outlets are talking about. We know that they are, in this case, we know they're talking about a topic. We know very little about what they're saying about the topic from this uh, structural topic modeling. We can take the opposite approach. We can say, uh, when outlets talk about one of the candidates, are they saying something good or bad without knowing very much what is being said? And indeed, uh, we can uh, come up with fairly uh, uh, face valid uh, measures of sentiment um, when it comes to the news outlets. So this is uh, mainstream media uh, looking at uh, overall evaluation of Clinton in blue, Trump in red. When it's high, it's good. Basically, when it's low, it's bad. Things, bad things are being said about the candidates. Um, I've identified those two scandals with the dotted lines. So you can see in the case of, of the first scandal, the, the Access Hollywood tape of Trump, that does seem to be followed with a bit of a dip. Uh, in terms of the sentiment associated with Trump during that time in mainstream media. However, uh, notably, he is no worse off than Clinton is um, during that period within mainstream media. By contrast, following, following the Comey letter, uh, Clinton is uh, severely punished in terms of the sentiment associated with her in mainstream media, whereas by the end of the campaign, Trump has uh, a very clear um, lead. Interestingly, the pattern is almost the same for uh, left-wing media, which we might have thought would be uh, more attuned to um, Hillary Clinton. So let me just uh, summarize what it is that we're looking at and trying to understand here. We do seem to have a, a media system characterized by dense interlinkages in terms of topical coverage, at least. They are talking about the same things, which is a kind of interesting finding given a lot of discussion about the fragmentation of the media system and the idea that we're having different conversations. We're, not having, we're talking about the same things. These are not different conversations, but they're talking about them uh, very, very differently. Um, then we do have similar responses to these shocks to the system. Mainstream, left-wing, right-wing media are all responding in similar ways to these kinds of scandals, although they're deviating from different baselines when it comes to how they treat their favorite candidate, perhaps not uh, surprisingly. I didn't show you this, but we, we didn't find any evidence of transmission of sentiment. So when the mainstream media, for example, dipped in its quality of assessment of Clinton, there didn't seem to be any spread of that to other parts of the media system. So different pieces of the media system seem to hold quite tightly to their own assessment of their candidate, although they were responsive to these idiosyncratic shocks. And I will close there. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, our final speaker is Derry Vijaya. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science focused on building the real algorithms. Uh, so Derry, please. There's still some. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so I'm an assistant professor in computer science working mostly on natural language processing. And today I'm going to talk about um, what my interests are on multimodality and how that can help the whole process of natural language understanding. So uh, to begin with, I want to give a cartoon example of what 
natural language understanding is actually about. So given the, the sentence, for example, here, the plane flies over the boat with a red bow, a system that is capable of natural language understanding should be able to understand the meaning of the sentence from the meaning of the words, uh, how the words interact with each other, and then come up with a hypothesis of what this sentence could mean. And a particularly good natural language understanding system will be able to pick the most plausible uh, meaning of the sentence, in this case for a plane to fly over a, a big boat with a, whose front part is colored red. So the idea of this natural language understanding is how can we map this, uh, so one way we can think about natural lang language understanding is how we can map the sentence, uh, the human language sentence, to something that is more machine readable and can be processed by machine. Uh, things that are relations and entities that are expressed uh, by the sentence. And the, the usefulness of such natural language understanding is that if we can build a good one, then it can be used to understand what's written in news articles, um, reason over them, or just for any application that require this large scale content analysis. But uh, how do we go about building such thing? So one way we can do it is by building uh, knowledge bases which contains this uh, vocabulary that could be used to express meaning in sentences. Like for example, this is uh, one of the knowledge base that is created automatically by reading from the web. It has a uh, vocabulary of relations and entities and also some example pairs of entities that have the relationship. And then the task of natural language understanding can be thought of as uh, mapping this natural language sentence to the relations and the entities in the knowledge base. Now, why is this uh, useful? Uh, because once we connect it to the, data uh, the knowledge base that has all this information, we can have access to more information about the entities and the relations uh, and more than what is being mentioned in text. So this can support things like abstraction, where uh, instead of you know, mentions of names, it becomes entities that have um, date of birth, um, all other informations about the entities. It can also support reasoning, so you can reason over the, the knowledge that you have. And when the system is being used to do prediction, then the knowledge can be used to support inter interpretability. So uh, in my previous work, I learned how to do this automatically, like how can we uh, map the relations in the knowledge base. Um, for example, here we have our null knowledge base, and then uh, we have the relations and the entity pairs that have the relations, and then on the other side we have the verbs. Uh, so we use the web to find mentions of these entity pairs, and based on the verbs that occur between them, we can do the mapping from relations <coughs> to entities. And similarly, we can do this to other languages as well. So for example, here we have the Portuguese knowledge base with some relations, some entity pairs, and then we can do the same thing to get the, the relation to a Portuguese verb mapping. But you can imagine like a foreign language knowledge base or any type of foreign language uh, data set, they might be sparse. So we can add actually the, the data from our English knowledge base to, to augment the data in the foreign language knowledge base. But then the question becomes, okay, we add these entity pairs. How do we find mentions of these English entities in Portuguese? So one very good resource for that that is human curated is actually uh, Wikipedia, because Wikipedia has the link you know, from English pages to about, I think, hundreds of foreign languages. So we can use Wikipedia interlingual links. It's called to do the mapping from the English entity to its mentions in many other languages. So in fact, this is what I carry on doing uh, and using this Wikipedia interlingual links to bridge uh, 
between words and say low resource language like Indonesian that doesn't have a lot of um, corpus for training translations. And via the interlingual links, we can bootstrap this translation to, uh, for example, the word kulkas in Indonesian to the word uh, is translation, which is refrigerator in English. So we can think about that word to word translation through Wikipedia as a task to complete the metrics. So here we have the the observations uh, on the left hand side, we have the observations in Wikipedia. So for example, we have the, the fridge in English that has a link to this kulkas in Dutch. And we also know this kulkas has a link to the word kulkas in Indonesian. So we can use that to infer translation from English to Indonesian. But there are cases, a lot of cases where we don't have the word in Wikipedia, for example, this word tidur, uh, it, there is no Wikipedia um, page on that, so we can't use Wikipedia to link them, and that's where we run to the different modalities. So instead of just using text, we can also use the images of the words to help us bridge from one language to another. Uh, so the idea is that when there's not enough text or observed translations, uh, we can use image similarities to induce translations because like the image of the word cat in many different languages would be similar. So this whole idea of using both images and text are what uh, underlie my interest uh, in research. So currently I'm doing work uh, with I think Margaret and Leigh just now who have given a talk at the at the first panel on how we can use uh, multimodality to detect the frames uh, that the journalists use uh, on different issues. For example, for the immigration issue, uh, the journalists can talk about the immigrants or the refugees in terms of them being the victims uh, that need protection or them being the intruders. So, depending on the frame, the kind of images, and the kind of headlines that they use could be different. So using both images and text uh, could help in detect detecting this uh, frame in news articles. And I've also currently used the, the idea of using both images and text to do more like um, labeling of unknown images. So basically if we have the image and we have the captions, then uh, if we see um, an image with an unknown object, but it has a caption of a word, then over time, for example, on the left, we see pancake and sausage. And if our system doesn't know either, we can think about it as being equally likely that the two objects could be either pancake or sausage. But as you see more images over time and you see sausage in other contexts with other objects, then you can have better confidence of what sausage and pancake looks like. So that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so in, in general, the idea, uh, the, the research that underlies uh, my interest, the interest that underlies my research is to create this um, multilingual, multimodal, shared semantic space where you can have text in different languages being mapped to their representation and also um, the, vec the, the representation of the images of the actors or the entities in the text. So this is useful and interesting because when we have such a um, semantic space, then we can do much more uh, disambiguation uh, more easily. For example, if I say there's a tank in front of my house, uh, should I panic right now or not? Because it could mean a couple of different possible tanks. Uh, but if we have an image also accompanying my, my tweet or whatever, then we can uh, be able, better able to disambiguate what this tank is about. And then a couple of other projects that I'm in involved in beside that was uh, is um, the idea of using NLP to help as a task. For example, with uh, Elaine, uh, we are working on how to identify the safe or unsafe products using uh, the text of the customer reviews. So if we plot, for example, like uh, this is very relevant to NLP because if we plot the word representation uh, and we 
we can see that in this plot, for example, that Rash and Scratchy are closer together to being a bad or negative words for cosmetic, while poisoning and toxic are closer to food for being a negative, while allergy, for example, is both uh, equally bad for cosmetic or food. So things like that uh, I'll be interested to work on, like if you need any NLP for whatever tech. Uh, task you need. Thank you. Fascinating talks. Uh, so before I open it to the audience, uh, I want to mention that most of the faculty here are new to BU, including me. Uh, so that was a careful selection of the panel. I mean, Lucy, of course, you're an exception. <laughs> I'm an old timer. Uh, so that's great. And in fact, uh, I mean, of course, there are many questions. In fact, I want to ask one question. In fact, I want, I'm wondering if uh, each one of you could comment on the time and effort it actually takes to build these things. Because you know, we talk about data as though we have it in our pocket. At the same time, we also talk about algorithms that you know, that you've been working on. At least in my case, I talked about Alzheimer's disease and osteoarthritis. Uh, there are national efforts. Millions and millions of dollars have been spent on, uh, you know, building these algorithms, building these data sets. And, and several investigators throughout the country have invested time and effort to build these things. And in fact, I was fortunate to meet these people to get these data sets. So I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, that, that, that aspect. In, in my case, I think the data sets are constantly evolving that we're building. We'll prototype an idea, often on a limited spatial extent. We'll try to test it out larger. But then new data sources become available. And then we start the process all over again. Um, a lot of our approach to CO2 is trying to couple some version of truth to trying to understand why. And that's dynamic. Um, so the problem that I, I'm uh, hoping to work on in the, in the next few years, I'm already putting a time, <laughs> time scale on it, um, is uh, I think it's complicated at the very beginning um, in terms of, uh, uh, I think the, the flow chart is relatively straightforward, but it's just you know building all these different models. Uh, I actually sp uh, also spoke a, uh, spoken to a few people, and I think it's, um, you know, conceptually it's quite straightforward. Um, but uh, technically, it's probably actually very challenging. So I don't really know how how much time and effort that I I would expect is at least on a few on a lot of few years. Okay. So for us, we have two data challenges. One is actually getting access to the data. Um, a lot <coughs> of data we use comes from companies, and sometimes they're willing to share. Other times they're not very willing to share. Um, sometimes we just keep pestering them until they share, uh, <laughs> if we're lucky. Um, the other challenge is actually processing this data because a lot of the information we have is unstructured text. And so we need to work with experts like Derry, um, who helps us to, to process that data and make sense of it. And that can take a lot of time. So uh, we had one project that was a summer project, and we spent about 90% of the time that summer just processing the data, and the last 10% trying to build models. I would say one thing from social science, especially communication, is we benefit from digital trace data. So a huge amount of data is simply being created. So we're not building CO2 detectors or, or using them at all. We can benefit from their availability. Um, the problem is that we have to assess their reliability and whether they're actually good data. To give two quick examples, uh, Twitter obviously has a massive ho housing of data. Um, and they've been giving us 1%. So we've been storing sort of 1% of Twitter for uh, five years, six years. Um, the question is, what is that 1%? Is it random? And what's the original sample that they're drawing from uh, that we, we sort of have to worry about those things? The same applies to news media texts. Um, and then to echo what Elaine said, uh, with, with uh, organizations such as Facebook, they've essentially closed the doors on academic research. So although it's the biggest social networking site in the world with a lot of concerns about its role in misinformation and polarization, uh, they have set up their own internal systems for um, for research which are far from transparent. Um, I guess for my case, um, I usually rely on other people to give me data. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so um, I think um, most of the data that we use in NLP are from the web. And uh, it's not good. It's noisy and it has bias. Uh, 
And so that's uh, one area that um, we are interested to work on, like how to remove or de-bias the training data that we use for NLP. Um, but yeah, we rely on, like uh, for example, lay uh, students to do the actual vetting of the data and then annotate them, and that takes, I think, most of the work, right? Like, yeah. All right, any questions from the audience to the panel? It's over there, yeah. My name is Katya Olenik, and I have a question to all of you. Uh, most of the work probably uh, within any research is done with students, right? So they, uh, what kind of challenges, um, what kind of knowledge you think they lack? Some of you are actually quite young, so what kind of knowledge you think uh, you miss uh, would you have to perform your research better? And what kind of what Boston University can do better to prepare to prepare the students in all these areas to uh, to make uh, the research more efficient, effective? I'm going to give a non-data science answer, which is one of the other hats that I wear is um, being an associate director for a new graduate student training grant, which is focused on trying to change some of the types of questions that students are asking to try to tackle societal problems. So how do we, how do we advance basic scientific understanding, fundamental science, while also solving society's problems? And that's hard to frame a question to be academically rigorous and societally relevant, and that's one of the problems that I'm most acutely facing and trying to tackle. Do we go by order? Any other questions? I know time is running out. I'm looking at Catherine. It's 12, 2 p.m., so. I mean, of course, the floor is open. It's lunchtime after this, so uh, I think the discussions would continue. Uh, so thank you again for uh, attending this session.